Join Sarah Weiss in the infinite field of energetic aliveness and heart-centered wisdom. This is the Earth Love Spirit Podcast. Welcome to the Earth Love Spirit Podcast. I'm Sarah Weiss, your host, and today I have a very special guest, and I think you'll agree. I'm here with Don Miguel Ruiz, Jr., a Toltec Master of Transformation. He is a direct descendant of the Toltecs of the Eagle Knight lineage and is the son of Don Miguel Ruiz, author of the acclaimed Four Agreements. By combining the wisdom of his family's traditions with the knowledge gained from his own personal journey, he now helps others realize their own path to personal freedom. He has so many books that he's published that are helpful to people applying spiritual teachings to their daily life. You'll see them listed in the notes for the podcast below. So let's get started. Hello, Don Miguel. Hello, Sarah. Good morning. How are you? So nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. How are you? Good. I'm really excited to have you on the podcast today. We have experienced very similar ways of spiritual teaching. For example, I reach new levels of consciousness by transcribing lectures by my Sufi teacher. And you absorb Toltec teachings by transcribing your grandmother's lectures from Spanish to English. It's a beautiful way of immersing in the spirit of the teachings. I was translating for my grandmother. I had to learn to shut out anything that distracted me from her. It's like I had learned to have the voice that's inside my head be hers. In order for that to happen, I had to learn to set my intent and focus my intention on her. So it was, it was the very beginning of all my apprenticeship with her. So I'm hearing you say you immersed yourself in her teachings. Mm -hmm. So immersion in the teacher is one of the universal ways that we learn on the spiritual path. Mm -hmm. Is that your experience? Well, for me, it's, it's uh, about experience. You know, it can, my father always set up situations where life became my teacher. You know, there'd be lectures, uh, stories, but it was always him pushing me in a direction of experience, the same as my grandmother. It was about having complete faith in yourself and your engagement with life. Life teaches us through action, reaction. For every action we take, there's a consequence. And a consequence is just the result of an action, either, neither good nor bad, nor right or wrong. It's a result. So life teaches us through that result, through that consequence. So my father and my grandmother both did that in their own unique way for me to experience it. Yes, they gave a lot of lectures and presentations. And most of the time I translated that, especially for my grandmother. But it was always that part of, of experiencing life that became my teacher. So from that point of view, yes, I immersed myself in a tradition. But in that tradition, I was always surrounded by juxtapositions and uh, dualities. You can say that my family was very spiritual in the sense that my, I had my grandmother and my grandfather, who were both spiritual healers, and my father and my uncles being uh, doctors, a neurosurgeon, an oncologist, a general practitioner, my, my mom's a dentist. So there's Western medicine as well as uh, traditional uh, homeopathic uh, medicine. I say homeopathic only to describe faith healing. And at the same time, as there's spirituality, there's academia where I went to school in the International Baccalaureate in Mexico and I went, I was pretty much an academic. And at the same time, I had spirituality at home. And another duality was I grew up and lived in San Diego, California, but every day I commuted into Tijuana to go to school. So I went to school in Tijuana, but I lived in San Diego up until my senior year where I, sp I spent it in San Diego. But I grew up in two totally different cultures uh, separated by a border wall and what is Tijuana and San Diego. I grew up speaking Spanish and English and I am the product of those two worlds. So you can say that in my life, it wasn't just one channel of information, 
but several. You know, for example, at this moment, I, I don't read spiritual books. I read books on physics. I, I enjoy reading uh, astrophysics and history as well. So those are my main uh, fountains of information that I read. And so you can say that that duality, that juxtaposition continues. So in that immersion, that was my family. You can say that in the way they treated their patients, for example, my grandmother, Sarita, my father, uh, my grandmother, she would heal and treat her patients with faith healing. And once in a while, she would send a patient of hers to one of my father, my father or my uncles, depending on what she needed, either being uh, something to do with uh, her, her nervous system, with which is my uncle Carlos with neurosurgery and neuroscience, and my uncle Luis with uh, cancer, and my father being a neurosurgeon and a general practitioner and family uh, therapist, it was done to him. So, and then in return, my uncles would sometimes send people over to my grandmother because at the very core of, of that belief was uh, of healing was the root that brought uh, illness and sickness into the body. That was, there was always a root. And you can say that my father, that's when he stopped being a medical doctor and became um, a Nawal when, because he realized that I, he wasn't always getting to the root. He wanted to get to the root of what causes disease which is our beliefs and the conditions that one believes. So I was raised in all that. It's, uh, it's not a, the simple way to put it is I was emerged completely in my family. And my family was spread out like a shotgun. We, it was just a spectrum. <laughs> so for me, you know, uh, Western medicine and uh, homeopathy, they're all in the same. They're instruments to heal. And you just got to choose the instrument that is relevant to what your need is. But what's important is needing, knowing what your need really is, as opposed to someone telling you what's supposed to be, getting to know yourself. And it always came that, back to that. Then that's why life is the teacher, because the consequences are always your own. It's your own life. So it always comes back to you. So it's an immersion in oneself, the life that I lead. And to a certain point, that's the whole point of being a Toltec, which simply means artist. I love that. I love that. And I loved something you said about where we, our responsibility ends at our fingertips, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which, which really is kind of unusual for Western people who are all <laughs> mired in everyone else's lives and mm -hmm. don't understand what that feels like to feel whole and complete unto yourself. So just, I was just curious about when you experienced your grandmother's healing services. Mm -hmm. So in the Toltec tradition that she was doing this in, how did the let's say the faith and prayer work interface with having someone start to begin to claim their inner knowing? Well, faith, the way I know it is in, in believing in something 100% without a doubt. It's not about blind faith, which you can't see something and you hope it's correct. No, it's, it's about having faith in what you know and what you know is yourself and your connection with the divine, with your connection with earth, your connection with nature, and your connection with humanity, your environment, life. It's always about having that ability to trust in your ability to take a step, to take an action, to say yes. At the very core of my grandmother's teaching was exactly that, faith. She always said, I am... I'm only the instrument by which life, God, heals. It is, I am the instrument. I am this thing. To me, in retrospect, looking back, faith healing is the equivalent of the placebo effect. You know, in, in Western mm -hmm. medicine, I can, I can translate it that way. The placebo effect has power. You give them, someone a sugar pill, 
and a certain amount of people uh, of patients who would get that actually feel better. And that's because they put their intent behind that placebo, that sugar pill and healing. And then that you set the intent and in the intent, it is what allows you to heal. So if anything, what I've learned throughout all these years in my own teaching is that we heal with our own permission. Mm -hmm. life so, has oh, power right. because we give it power the same energy i use to move my arm to move my leg is the same energy i use to create a thought and at the root of every belief i have there is a yes that gives it power my word has power because i'm alive to give it life just like my body is an in a vessel uh matter that in the moment I let go of it, it just becomes an inanimate object. And the difference between the inanimate object that this body will one day be, which is what we know as a corpse, and the person that's engaging you right now is that I'm alive, but I am not this body because I don't take it with me. My body is alive because I'm here to give it life in the same way that I am not the mind, but my, my mind exists because I'm here to manifest it. I am not the mind, I'm not this body but I'm the force that animates both. With understanding that, my word has power because I'm here to give it life, just like my love. My love exists because I'm here to manifest it. Prayer. Prayer has power because I'm here to manifest it. It's a vessel. It's an instrument by which I can focus my intent which is just another word to describe spirit, soul, intent, life, nagual, God, whatever word we want to use, but it's that ability that we use to animate this body, that animates this mind, that animates a prayer in the same way that love is created and I'm the source of it. So my prayer has power because I'm here to give it life. And then if you go in a little deeper, you realize that we create a prayer with words as this crutch in order because we create a focal point using words in order for us to describe intent. But then it gets to a point where you realize you don't need words to create a prayer. The intent, or you can say the energy animated is all you need, which simply means that at one point, my breath becomes prayer. My heartbeat becomes prayer, a moment of communion. From that point, that is the, the source of my grandmother's faith in her prayer. My prayer is alive because I'm alive to manifest it. Powerful and beautiful, thank you. So you could almost say that your grandmother, if we turn the words around, in help people find their own faith. Yes. And she saw herself as the instrument to their in own intent. Kind of like if I were to be sick right now, I would go and see a nurse or a doctor, a nurse practitioner or a, a, my, my family doctor. Now I'm using them as the instrument to heal me. So a certain way, that's exactly how my grandmother saw and engaged her patients. Whether they knew it or not, they were using her to set their intent in healing. This is beautifully spoken. Let's go into this a little more because this turns everything upside down and brings it back to each person. And taking any kind of dependency or belief in anything external and bringing it back to the internal that mm -hmm. the person who you might be consulting with let's say is a mirror for your own healing capacity yes that's why I, I, i've gotten to that lesson where we heal with our own permission mm -hmm. so it doesn't matter if it's a doctor a faith healer a reiki practitioner a shaman or anyone Mm -hmm. You set the intent. So you can say you're co-creating. And yes. you, you're 
co-creating with someone who has studied the body in a certain way or aura or energy, depending on who you go to. It's uh, someone who has created a base of knowledge of information in a form of a craft that allows them to understand. You know, it's like going to a chiropractor to feel better and help heal the spine. And at the same time, you can go to your yoga instructor and find that instrument that allows you to strengthen that core, that allows you to help feel better with your spine, or going to your kickboxing instructor and teaching you how to move. All three will get you to the point where you strengthen your core and to a certain point where it helps the body heal and feel better with their spine. But if you use all three of them in unison, the body will be in a good place and you're using them to guide you in that journey. And same thing if you go with a doctor, you know, the doctor will heal you if you are a willing participant, meaning that you're a good patient. If you're a, will, a good patient to the doctor's eyes, it's basically someone who engages the, the treatment. Or you can say uh, someone who goes to physical therapy. A good patient there is someone that will follow the instructions of the physical therapist to do those stretches, to do those small little gestures or movements. Sometimes they feel mundane when you go to a physical therapist and they give you this small little move your finger, curl it, straighten it out, curl it. A thing simple like that can actually change your whole life if you're recovering from a tendon injury in your right hand, which is what happened to me. <laughs> if you follow suit and you listen to them, you will heal. But in order for that to work, it requires your full collaboration. And in this regard, it is basically using your intent to heal. They've given you the instrument, the information to heal. You just gotta follow through. And so given our rising awareness about energy and resonance and unity, how do you think that plays into um, activating that intent? Well, it requires awareness, of course, the ability to be present. Although sometimes it's hard, you know, it, it's, it's easy to project responsibility and give it away. It's something that in our domestication uh, or conditioning, whichever word we want to use, we give away our power to a belief or an idea of how it's supposed to be. It's all of a sudden it's not our fault, it's someone else's fault, it's the program's fault, it's the domesticated belief. But in the moment you realize that a belief only exists for as long as you say yes to it and realize that that yes comes from oneself, all of a sudden you look at everything you've said yes, all your beliefs only exist because you exist to give them power, to make them so. The moment you change that yes into a no, a belief will cease to exist. The moment you have that moment of awareness is the moment where you realize, oh, I can use my intent to either tear myself down and create the most perfect nightmare, or I can create the most harmonious dream. When you have that moment of clarity, just like an alcoholic or addict that realizes that I can change my life if I reset it. It's, I can take back control of my body and not let my addiction control it. It's kind of like my grandma used to say during my apprenticeship, do you control knowledge or does knowledge control you? And oftentimes she would, she would change that to say sometimes, for example, do you drink the bottle? The bottle drinks you or whatever else. It's a moment where you become aware of how you've given away your power to a different belief or an idea or someone else's judgment of you and you reclaim it. And it's all about becoming aware of the things in your life that have power because you've given them that power. And to me, that is a moment of clarity. We work in our tradition I, would, I was about to say very hard, but in reality, it's just simply putting up a mirror and letting someone see that in themselves. And you have to have patience because sometimes it's right away. Or sometimes it takes several, several tries. And in that patience, 
when they have that moment of clarity, it's funny to see that smile come up and that moment of realization go, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, it's, and it's great to see. So it, it's, it comes down to that realization of what, like you said earlier, being willing to see the reflection of that mirror that we put up. And sometimes we don't want to see it because we don't want to be responsible. You know, that's, that's, mm-hmm. that's one of those things that it's when you got used to someone else being responsible, you, it's really hard to reclaim that because now you are responsible and what happens in your life is your choice. You know, you bring up patience. I don't think of our culture here in the U.S. as a very patient culture. And I know for myself that even with my spiritual teacher 50 years ago, he made me go through practices to develop patience. It was the most crucial skill and personality development I could have engaged in. It took two years Mm. to find that place of patience. Um, And what that meant in the deepest sense of being able to align with the deeper uh, soul frequencies and alignment with my own self and alignment with the earth and the cosmos. Uh, Mm -hmm. That was that was a pretty strenuous practice. Um, How how do you work with people to develop patience? Well, it's something that you have to work within yourself first. And in looking back on my how my family did it, mm-hmm. how to have family. It, it, it was, it, I'm going to say it's, it was a mean thing when I was young. And now I think of it as a brilliant thing. And what I mean, that is my dad used to have this thing to say, Miguel, let your brother win. Let your brother win. And I wanted to win, but my dad says, let him win. And I wanted to win so bad. And I, like, I had to really bite down and just like take that step backwards and let him win, let him win. And for the longest time, I really thought how unjust, how, you know, all this kind of thing, how, how, yeah, how unjust. And then as I grew older and then I had my, my own children and my son has autism, Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how much that little exercise my father did helped me with the patience with my own children mm-hmm. and realizing like it's all about taking a step back it's 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 basically in letting him when it taught me to take a step back and witness my brother my brothers i should say uh create something in front and sometimes with a teacher it's all about taking that step backwards and letting that apprentice or that student come to realization on their own time. It's not your my journey, it's their journey. Let them win. And what and that simply means is take a step, take a st- step back and witness. Do your thing, of course, but pay attention. And I didn't realize how much patience my father taught me with that, even though when I was young, like I said before, I felt it like such injustice because what about me? What about me? And it, and it, it, it really helped me to be selfless to a certain point. Of course, when, the, when I got the green light to go for that win, I would take it <laughs> like like a hawk, <laughs> and uh, that's where my father taught me patience. And then being pa- having the patience to in myself to be aware of my triggers in, in my own journey. What triggers me to react? What triggers me to domesticate? What triggers me to believe all my conditions and all that kind of thing? It requires patience because you can't practice, for example, you can't practice taking things personal in the past. You can't change a yes to a no or no to a yes because life is no longer there to manifest it. It only exists in my memory. And I can't practice taking things personal in the future because the future only exists in my imagination. It's not really action. The only place where I'm able to express action, which is simply 
the expression of will or intent is in this present moment. And in order for that to happen is being patient to realize when the moment has arrived and being aware of that. Such a huge mouthful of wisdom in just a few minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so um, one other curiosity I had was you've mentioned that your father took you to Peru when you were younger. Yeah, my, I, I went there um, in 1999. Uh huh, and uh, you talked about him shifting your assemblage point and and maybe other things that happened there. Are you open to sharing some of that with us? Well, yeah. Um, the significance of that journey to Peru and Teotihuacan, um, mm -hmm. and that's happened in stretches of five months from one another, is that during my apprenticeship, when I first started my apprenticeship with my father, I was fourteen years old, and my, my father says, okay, we, that's the initiation. And my father said, I'm not going to really push you until you finish your education. I don't want to disrupt your education. I want you to focus on that. In the meantime, you're going to work with your grandmother and completely immerse yourself in her teachings, which was great, of course. And of course, I still went to a lot of my father's power journeys. I sat through a lot of the lectures and sermons and all that good stuff. I could probably teach a lot of things uh, because I paid attention, not because I've actually experienced it, but I'd heard it. And then I graduated college in 1999 in, in that, uh, that beginning, that summer, I guess, uh, or spring, I don't, I don't remember. I think it was the beginning of June, so it was spring. So that fall, my father took me for the first time to Peru, which is the very a journey much, much further away from Teotihuacan. And, you know, I, I, I kept going into what I listened to my father, but this time my father put a little bit more oomph in his teachings and let me experience things. One day, when I was in Machu Picchu, uh, after being in Cusco, uh, Urubamba, uh, mm -hmm. we went up there. I, I woke up one day being feeling really, really sick, just, just nauseous, just in pain, uh, just not feeling good. My my roommate at the time, Jeff, and I like a. Uh, we shared rooms and, you know, we were, we were both the two 20 something year old guys hanging out with the 20 something girls in the journey and we were having fun. So I woke up one morning and I don't know if I ate something bad or I don't know what it was, but I was processing something in my body that just hurt and it was centered completely in my solar plexus. It's just this awful, awful feeling that, you know, it's just, and we're going up the, to, you know, we got on the bus, we go up the hill towards Machu Picchu. And it, it, we've been there for two days. So this is the second day of being there. We go up and my father teaches, not, uh, there's the main area where all the ruins are in Machu Picchu. So if you go up the hill a bit more, there's a little, uh, area where there's enough stone where you can sit in the group of us mm -hmm. sat there and I just laid down and I just basically put my both hands in my solar plexus because that's where it was hurting my father began to teach and I just felt like I just nodded off for a little bit and I had kept my hands in there when I awoke, the pain was completely gone. And all of a sudden, where I, before I was drudging and whatever, I was just skipping along. I felt like I had all this energy. I had was just this ball of energy that I just couldn't stop bouncing around. I just had a I just had this incredible amount of energy. From then on, we finished the journey. We went to Kuros, uh, to Cusco. And I'm back to, uh, to Lima and we left. It was a wonderful time. And then a few months later, we go to Teotihuacan. And this is 
if I went to Peru in November, then this would be February or March of 2000. And my father takes me to Teotihuacan, goes up the Pyramid of the Sun and shifts it. You know, he looks into my eyes, blows air into my forehead. And I felt like I just, I don't know. I just, I just know that I felt like a huge weight was lifting off my shoulder. And when I opened my eyes, it was like seeing everything for the very first time. And it was beautiful. And I wept. It felt wonderful. And my father said, now go home, conquer death by becoming alive. Mm -hmm. And for several days, I walked as if I was you know, stoned. I hadn't taken anything. My father, my family doesn't do hallucinogenics or anything for their for their traditions it's all meditation my grab i think it, it would be the closest analogy would be doing everything through breath work and going deep into breath work you know if, if you've ever done breath work you know that you get to a certain point where you're like life will teach you so much it's, it's so powerful you don't really need to take anything other than just doing that breath work it's beautiful but going back to the world you know i felt i was still in that space but little by little i was descending i was totally going into my whole world and little by little little by little little by little i fell down 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 crash and my whole world just fell apart and the funny thing is that my mind still thought that i was still up there <laughs> But little by little, everything crashed and everything, my whole dream fell apart. And, and this is, it took a good two years to get to that point. And ultimately it was my father's heart attack and then losing someone I love, someone I wanted to marry. And the whole thing just, I couldn't project. I couldn't, it was, how, how can I blame her when I realized everything it was all me. It was all me. I could not project blame to her. It was me. And my biggest heartbreak I ever had in my life was realizing that I wasn't what I pretended to be. And not only did I lose someone I wanted to marry, you know, at, at that point, my, the love of my life up to that point, I'm married now, of course, I'm with my wife for 16 years but at that time it was a big loss and then my father had his heart attack and he was in coma for nine weeks a bubble burst and you can say that's when i really began to practice my family's tradition i used the information i learned to help me heal and i started again so you can say that yes i started my apprenticeship uh, when I was 14 years old, but it wasn't until I was about 2002, I was 26 years old when it, it really just crashed and I really applied it for the very first time. Don't you think that everything was leading up to that? Isn't that what I consider part of um, coming back to your true self? Um, in retrospect, yes, you know, like mm -hmm. I still remember that one night when I woke up and it felt like I was throwing up and I wasn't throwing up, but it's that one moment where all of a sudden like, you're, 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 uh, retching, whatever comes out, you know, and it's the moment you let it all out. It's just, it's the moment you let out the parasite. Mm-hmm. Whether it's leading up to that or not, it's, it's different for everyone. You know, it's, it's. You, moment an aha moment a moment of clarity or what my brother would say um, when life comes and slaps you in the face it's the moment of you have a choice uh, you continue your old trajectory or you change so at that, that you can say that it could all, all it could have all led up to that point but in that point there's a very important choice to be made to continue or to change now here's the thing if i say continue 
I'm going to put it in this way. I could still be practicing the Totec tradition, but I'll be practicing the four conditions as opposed to the four agreements. Yes. The four conditions are the corruption of the four agreements. And it's basically using the four agreements to domesticate myself with. I'll only love myself if I live up to the four agreements. If I live up to this image of Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. At that moment, I'm just using the tradition to domesticate me and pretend to be something I am not. Or you actually apply and do the work. And so was there a big choice there or was it obvious to you? I wanted to live. That's, that was the choice. I want to live. I, it's, it's a choice where I no longer want to feel what I was feeling, you know, and whether I taught or not didn't matter. Right. It really didn't matter whether I became a teacher or not. It had nothing to do with that. I all of a sudden realized that that was not making me happy and I wasn't living. I was following an illusion that didn't exist. So I let go of it. Whether it took me, you know, I've now I've become a teacher in my own way. But that was just more of a, a a result of putting things into practice and putting things in my own words and and engaging that experience. But in that moment, it it wasn't about I want to be a teacher. No, it 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 was about I want to live. I I don't like where I was heading and that was it. That's a, a pretty big crisis point. I mean, it makes everything in your life change. And I find that people want to resist that. Um, you know, they don't want things to change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, so when we have a big crash like that, uh, it's, it's a huge gift in a way that it makes it just so obvious that we can't go any other way, but to live like that, to live in the power. And it's, and it's, it's daunting because you're basically assuming responsibility for your own intent. It's, it's, that's what free will is to, to have free wills, to be able to say yes and no with a complete freedom of life. And with that, like Uncle Ben told Peter Parker, with great power comes great responsibility, which <laughs> simply means I assume responsibility for the consequences of my choices. And that, that uh, a lot of times is what stops someone from doing that journey, to actually be completely and totally responsible for your own will. So then that leads me to bring up about love. Um, because I find that if we are to move through, if I'm to move through into this place of responsibility, that I can't do it without being in a state of love. It, it has to surround, infuse, and inform all of that, or I can turn everything into that corruption. Well, the thing about it is that it's the moment where you realize, or at least in my case, that I corrupted love, that what I knew that love was, was the biggest demon in the world. Mm -hmm. I believe the definition of love more than the experience of love. And it should be this way. It's what conditional love is. Conditional love only sees what it wants to see. Unconditional love is the willingness to love. So love. Either, both of them are love. Conditional love is love but it's based from fear of losing it. Love is outside of me. I believe that love will live and be experienced only when someone deems it me worthy of that love. That's the conditional. It's, 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 it's seeing love from the point of view of scarcity. And it's mo the motivator that gives power to condition, uh, to domestication, to con uh, conditioning or any of those things is that it's the motivator of that domestication and it's love, but it's created a perfect nightmare. So in unlearning things, it's you begin to uncorrupt love, meaning that it's no longer the motivator 
of why you do things. It becomes the source of why you do things. Instead and of the need. Exactly. Mm -hmm. My love exists because I'm here to manifest it. Without me, it does not exist. Let's say that love is an energy that creates a bond and it flows freely. If we understand, if we understand from that point of view, love is something that has no shape. It shapes itself like water does to whatever container it's in. And we, in our society, in our cultures, in our humanity, we've created uh, meaning and definitions in order for that love to fit or to, for us to understand plutonic love, romantic love, unconditional love, conditional love, all these words to try to describe something that we feel. But when you realize that I'm the constant in every relationship that I am in and my love will be expressed as unique as the relationship I am in with the person that I am with, then it's always changing. So as the source of love in my life, my breath exists because I'm here to create it. My love exists because I'm here to create it. How do I want to express it? How do I want to engage it? And when I realize that I've been corrupting it, an example of this would be this. My brother taught me a lesson uh, with the Jaguars and I've heard the same lesson from the Cherokee version so I'll tell the Cherokee version because I like it mm -hmm. one day a grandfather take, takes his grandson to, and teach him the tradition of his people so he takes him up the hill and sets up this little fire pit and when the night is perfect and the flame is arising he begins to share the traditions of his family and one of the stories is, inside of us, there lived two wolves. One, a wolf of love and compassion. The other one, a wolf of hate and jealousy and envy. They both live within us. The grandson hears this, meditates on it for a little bit, and then asks, if I make them fight, which one will win? And the grandfather answers, the one you feed. Now, the first time I heard this, I heard that story and that, and that delivery. And my answer was, well, you feed the wolf of love, of course. You want that love, and I'm going to feed that, uh, that side of me the most. And then I became aware of what unconditional love is. And unconditional love is the willingness to see the whole of me. It's the willingness to see the whole of the yin and yang and accept all sides of that yin and yang and realize that it's always just been one circle. I am both the wolf of love and compassion as much as I am the wolf of hate and jealousy and all that stuff. I am both wolves. Unconditional love is the willingness to accept both sides, the whole of me. So I'm going to feed both. The difference is, is that I'm not going to make them fight anymore. The cycle ends with me. When I realized that about my life, it's accepting that we can say the shadow self, accepting that whole side of me, that's me. It's like me saying, hello, my name is Miguel Angel Ruiz Jr. And I do take things personal. I do take things personally. Sometimes I make assumptions and I believe them. I'm not skeptical at all. I buy a hook, line and sinker. Sometimes I don't do my best, just ask my wife. <laughs> it's my witness. It is the moment where I stop pretending to be something I am not and I see myself as I am. At that moment is when I stop corrupting love and I clean it. It's the redemption of love and it coincides with the redemption of the mind. When the mind no longer is the parasite and becomes my ally. It is the moment where I no longer use words to go against me, which means there's the moment where I start practicing being impeccable with my word. And every word that I use is an empty symbol whose definition is subject to agreement, which means the agreement is just a word that reflects the action of saying yes to something. That's what an agreement is, the action of saying yes. 
an agreement has power because I say yes, which means a word has power because I say yes to it. A belief has power because I say yes to it. The truth exists with or without me. It doesn't need me for it to exist. But a belief only exists for as long as I say yes to it. And that's the difference between a belief and the truth. The moment I change a yes into a no, a belief will cease to exist. The truth will continue to exist whether or without that yes or no. So does this require uh, an incredible strength of mind and will to make these shifts? Only at the beginning. Once, uh, like you said, once you let go of the resistance and you accept it, it becomes easy. It's kind of like when you go for a run and I, I, I run marathons and half marathons, the hardest part of a the hardest part of any run is putting on your running shoes and your running gear and that's it. As soon as you have that running gear and your shoes, the rest is easy. Mm -hmm. You simply put one foot in front of the other and there you go. It's, it's that moment. But once you take that step, all you have to do is follow through. It reminds me what a teacher once ta taught me. The key to enlightenment is effort. That's it. That's all she said. Since then, I've learned that effort is using the energy that animates this body, that animates this mind to manifest something. That's what effort is. Discipline is remembering to apply that effort every day. So let go of the drill sergeant in your head. It's all about making that choice to take that step forward. That's all discipline is. Remembering to apply that effort every day. And success is simply following through, follow through, follow through. It's like taking a breath. It's an action. So the hardest part in all that is at the beginning setting your focus because at first you're just trying to convince yourself. It's like, because it's like you're trying to really read learn something new but in the Toltec tradition there's nothing to learn but to unlearn which is to let go let go of anything that gets in the way of your own life but sometimes that's letting go of a belief or an idea or condition and take the chance and take that step and enjoy it mm. enjoy is a key mm -hmm. it's, you can say passion Yes. Let's not confuse passion with obsession. Obsession is constantly trying to live up to an image or you're constantly chasing that carrot. Passion is using that carrot to fuel you to take that step forward. It's doing something you love to do. So have you been working on a new book that's coming to completion? I seem to remember seeing that somewhere. Yes, I am working on a book um, with Higher Fund Publishing. Mm -hmm. It should be coming out next year. So I'm, we're in the editing phase, and it's right now in the my publisher's hands. So I'm waiting to see what survived and what didn't survive. I'm in a phase <laughs> of the editing process, and we'll find out. You know, I I think they've settled on on a title, but we've settled in a title because it, it, we have a working title, and but, but that not not always stays you know it's good. we we have our titles and the title the ending title reflects the the end message so we'll see we'll see how it goes and I, I, at the moment i believe the title will be the mastery of life ah okay so you also are initiating a new program with your family mm -hmm. Starting in January, an apprenticeship program. You want to share that information with us? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm learning about it myself too. Um, <laughs> my brother, my my brother took on apprentices earlier this year, uh, year or last year, and he was pretty successful. But I took also apprentices a couple of years back, but I did it in person. So based on what's happening with the COVID and all kind of thing. My brother came up with a project with uh, with my dear friend and brother, Aaron, 
and my cousin Carla uh, to create that journey. So in the uh, in the formula or the shadow, um, not the shadow, the in the way that my brother did his apprenticeship program a year back, we're just adding now myself and my father. So it's the first time my father's decided to start teaching in that way. So we recorded videos because it's a combination of recorded videos and then online uh, calls uh, where all three of us will be on there. And right now we're still going through the whole process. Like today we're at noon, I'm gonna go, my brother, my Aaron, Carl, my dad, my brother and I, we're all gonna be going, logging in again and seeing how the group section will work and if, it, if it's something we can do. It so sounds it's, fantastic. It's called a path to authenticity, a four month apprentice program. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And that one, my, my dad takes the lead. So my, my dad is like, uh, let's just put it this way. When we did the videos, my dad sat down and taught. He gave a lesson. Then once he stopped, he looked at both of us and says, who's ready? Who got inspired by what I just taught? It would be Jose or I. So Jose would go in there and I would listen to what Jose. And then when it was my turn, I'd wrap it all up. So that's how these recordings were, were created. We, my dad set the precedent. He, he is the lead. I see myself as TA in this one, to be honest with you. Sometimes uh, that's how I envisioned it and following because you know it's, it's, it's sometimes easier to, instead of having three cooks in the kitchen there's always the lead chef and the sous chefs and all that kind of things in there creating the 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 presentation so that's how we created it my father took the lead my brother and i supported that presentation in our own unique way and then uh it'll launch in january and then at the end at the end of each step, where we do a live call or presentation. I'm not sure yet if it's going to be Skype or phone call, whatever. I'm not sure. Um, but I know that we'll be doing it live and answering uh, preset questions. People will be sending in questions and then Aaron will be giving it to us. That way it makes easy because we've learned that if we do live questions as things go along, it gets it gets uh it gets bottled up it gets it 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 doesn't flow so well mm -hmm. but we realize that if we have preset questions then all we have to do is just address them when we're doing it that's how my brother did it and we're going to follow that same lead it'll be great we'll yeah it sounds it like a very special opportunity uh, the information to find that program will be in the in the podcast notes uh, as, along with the information to find your your uh, website and the information about your books as well. Thank you. So as we come to a close here, is there anything else you'd like to share with people that we haven't covered yet? Well, Sarah, I just, first I want to say thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be on your program, the Earth Love Spirit podcast. I want to say thank you to everyone listening to, for giving me the permission to share my family tradition with everyone. In this holiday season and New Year's Eve and beginning of a, a lot of shifts, I wish you and your, all your family and friends and beloveds happiness, joy, abundance of love, and may you all be healthy and take care of one another. It's, it is a time to give each other permission to heal, to let those divisions among us to be set aside and see what really matters in life and what matters in life is the people we love life is precious and the people in our life are equally so so with all that enjoy life enjoy being you have fun and enjoy every relationship you're in mm, my heart is full Thank you. Blessings to everyone. And we look forward to your comments and your connecting with the programs that are available through Miguel's family. They're a very special opportunity. Take advantage of it now. So take care, everyone. Have fun.
Thank you for listening to the Earth Love Spirit podcast today. Check out the podcast notes so that you have the contact information for Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. And click on the Spirit Heal Institute link to find out about the solstice meditation I have coming up on December 20th. It's called Total Transformation. And of course, you know that the upcoming solstice and the energies that we're immersed in right now are very powerful. So we want to be as aligned as possible with the solstice energy so that we have a great catapult into 2021, a catapult of transformation. Blessings. Thanks for listening to the Earth Love Spirit Podcast. If you like what you heard, the best compliment you can give us is to share this podcast with a friend. And be sure to give us some stars and a favorable review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in.